from Microbe TV. This is Twin, This Week in Neuroscience, episode number seven, recorded on June 8th, 2020. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You're listening to the podcast all about the nervous system. Joining me today from New York City, Ori Lieberman. Hi, Vincent. Hello again. How are you? I'm good. Hanging in there. Good. You know, we're, it's, it's the summer. It's nice out, so I'm happy. Also joining us from Salt Lake City, Jason Shepard. Hi, Vincent. With his sleeping, with his sleeping dog there behind. <laughs> I took my background off so so Aaron can. <laughs> I Aaron, love it. Aaron That's was like, I was like oh, just watching his dog. <laughs> this is why I show up every every uh, couple weeks. <laughs> so, oh, we have to make sure Jason's on so we can get Aaron. <laughs> also joining us from Nashville, Tennessee, Aaron Calipari. Hi. I'm- Jealous of Ori's nice weather. You know, when it's summer down here in Nashville, it's not as nice as uh, up in New York City. So, but jealous. Yeah, is it, is it too we're, in the, we're in the high 70s, and it's sunny. It's it's not humid yet. It's beautiful. Oh, yeah. We're already in the, like, 90s, mid, mid-90s, humid, like, don't go outside weather. So, it'll only well, get worse for me. You guys are complaining. It's, I woke up today and it was 40 degrees. 40 <laughs> degrees. Wow. It was snowing. It's snow. There's snow in the hills. It's like, what is going on? <laughs> That's the opposite end of terrible. Yeah. Well, it was 100 degrees last week. So, you know. Aaron, are you uh, all back at the lab or is it partial? Some of us, partial. You know, we didn't get it too bad down here, um, probably because we're already socially distanced just in our way of life. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we're at 30% capacity right now. Everyone's wearing masks. There's lots of screening and testing and things like that. So, it's been not too bad, but mm. the tourists are back in town. Uh, Nashville itself is open. Mm. So, we'll see in a few weeks mm. what the what the consequences of that are. Mm. And what about you, Ori? You you you're not a medical student yet, right? No, so a couple weeks, um, and uh, I've been back in lab for the last two weeks doing some mm-hmm. electrophysiology recordings, trying to finish up uh, some revisions for yeah. a paper. Um, then we're masks on. I think twenty percent capacity. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, f- the, f- the funny thing is that it's quite difficult to do patch clamp recordings with a mask on because you need to mouth pipe head. Yeah. So it's <laughs> so everyone's constantly cross contaminating. Uh, yeah, yeah, so we're both at Columbia. We're, we're we're ramping up slowly. Columbia is, but my lab was just one person before, during, and now. So <laughs> we haven't changed anything. I'm ramping from one to two days a week. So I go in on Tuesdays and Fridays. How about you, Jason? Uh, uh, yeah, we went back about two weeks ago as well, but at a limited fashion, we got twenty percent or so, like two or three people at a time. Mm. Um, Utah was doing pretty well, but then, you know, they, we never actually had a full lockdown. And then two weeks ago into things being pretty open. And, you know, now we have um, the highest uh, week of cases uh, since it started. So yeah. it's not getting better. <laughs> so you think that's because of everyone going back all of a sudden? I think so. I mean, hmm. we had, um, you know, because we didn't, I think people were pretty cautious and then they just decided that, oh, it's all over and we're just going to go back to living life normally. So restaurants started opening, yeah. people started to have social outings. You go to the park and it's just packed. So, no, and face masks? No, none? Well, yeah, it's hit or miss. It depends. I mean, it's still like city for the most part. I think I've seen people wearing them, but uh, outside of the city, it hasn't been great. Like, oh. if I go down to the small towns and no one no one wears them. Nashville is very similar. It's all, like, a neighborhood dependent. So, like, you know, you go Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, there's not a person <laughs> without a mask, and then you go to, like, Publix or Kroger and nobody has a mask. Yeah. So, it's mm. very, uh, <laughs> you know, it depends on what bubble you live in, if people are mask wearing or not. I think, Ori, in New York, maybe half of the people on the streets are wearing masks, right? 
Yeah, I think it's it's pretty high. The problem is that then people are not wearing them correctly. Yeah, I see them <laughs> on down. the chain. Right. Yeah. Um, right. But and the parks. I mean, I spent the week, both days and the weekend in the park, and they're pretty busy. But people are staying separate as much as possible. Yeah. I mean, I I, and I think outside you're fine. I mean, I didn't see any problem with not wearing a mask outside, but inside for sure. I went to a yeah. little rally in our town yesterday. A little, you know, a Black Lives Matter rally. And I don't know, the three, four hundred people in this park. And I was amazed. Everyone had a face mask on yeah. in my little suburban town here. Um, and I drive around, I see people wearing. I'm actually kind of proud that Americans, at least around here, got used to wearing face masks, right? Because they're always critical. Why is that person wearing a face mask, you know, a year ago? <laughs> and now they're getting used to it. But again, yeah. they don't wear it properly. I see a lot of them pulled down and also... Some of them look pretty dirty to me, like, you know, they're the reusable kind, <laughs> and they need to be washed. We had a guy come a couple of weeks ago to fix the AC, and he must have been wearing his for weeks, you know. It's just uh, it's just funny, but we'll see what happens. Yeah, as everyone – but there are parts of the U.S. where cases are, are skyrocketing. You know, there's this great map in the Times where they show colors declining or rising, and – you know, New York and New Jersey is blue, which is declining, but many parts of the country are red. And I think, uh, you know, around Chicago, some places down south, California has got big increases too. Mm. And of course, you leave the country. Many countries are shooting up. Brazil is having a huge outbreak right now. It's just arrived there. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, New Zealand has that there's zero active patients yeah. with uh, the illness, so they've they're um they're they're back to normal life now. Pretty much. Yeah, we've gotten a few emails from listeners and TWIV listeners in New Zealand, and they really uh, have done an amazing job. And then someone wrote that the restaurants are open. The prime minister, she went to go in and she couldn't get in because <laughs> it was yes. packed. <laughs> <laughs> that was a very New Zealand. It was a very New Zealand thing. Um, you know, that's a very uh, down to earth culture, and so. Even the prime minister doesn't get special treatment. <laughs> Gee, I wish we had that here, you know. <laughs> <laughs> sure, yeah. Yeah, I say New York is a little different too for that kind of stuff. It is. It is. <laughs> I just think yeah, you I, can't get a reservation anyway here. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, I hear Ori that half the restaurants in New York are not going to open eventually. They're all yeah, I mean, well, business. in Washington, in Washington Heights, many restaurants have closed, including Coogan's, which has been around for a long time, which is the only uh, Irish slash cross country slash Dominican bar in the country. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I think a lot of restaurants won't reopen. It will be very interesting to see where New York is in a year. Aaron, you didn't know Coogan's, did you? No, I didn't. That That's not my scene. I, I was a very <laughs> different kind of scene there. Were you up at the medical center? You know, you're at Morningside, right? I, w I was at uh, Mount Sinai. So I was... Uh, oh, sorry. You're not Columbia at all. Right? Yeah. Right. So, no, no. I'm on the other the other side. The east and side, bit, man. Uh, down. Yeah. Yeah, you're on the east side. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, um, I'm going to give hand it over to Ori because you've got two two interesting papers that you picked. So help us get through them. <laughs> okay. Um, so both of these papers are um, discussing the concept of stress and how the stress and how stress affects the the body. Oh, that's um, why you picked them because these are times of stress. <laughs> yes, yeah, so actually, I picked the I picked one, and then the second one that we talked about that we'll talk about, and then Andres suggested the other one, and they actually kind of come together quite nicely. Um, so. Stress is obviously something that we are all dealing with right now and uh, in general, um, and there are consequences to stress. Um, so um, you can kind of feel crummy. Um, you can also have changes in your body. So, for example, your hair can be gray. Um, I can I can tell you when different hairs have started to come in that are definitely gray, depending on what stressful event has happened. Um, but not very much is known about how like what the neural mechanisms are for how these stress signals are transduced to the periphery. Um, and the first paper we'll talk about is uh, titled hyperactivation of sympathetic nerves drives depletion of melanocyte stem cells. Um, and the first author is Bing Zhang and the last author is Ya Chi Shu. And this is from a number of authors, including from Harvard and MIT um, and then two medical schools in Brazil. 
um, and it was published in Nature in January. And they um, asked kind of a very fundamental question. What is what drives hair graying after stress? Um, and they introduced a number of different paradigms in the mouse to induce stress. Um, and these are thing, these are paradigms that are quite well validated. Um, stress research is a large field that goes back many, many years in neuroscience. Um, so one of these is restraint stress, where a mouse is um, restrained either usually in a tube um, for several hours. And um, this is quite stressful, as you can imagine. Um, there's chronic unpredictable stress. So, um, of course, one aspect of stress is when something is stressful initially but becomes predictable, you can develop coping mechanisms. But in this paradigm, um, you stress the mice with different with different types of stresses at random intervals. So the mice can never really predict when the stress will come. That's kind of like reward, right? I think Aaron was talking about that. You get used to reward and it doesn't mean yeah. anything, right? Well, yeah, no, I think that the, you know, unpredictability is yeah. in, to a lot of these kind of learning based models and how that influences how animals make decisions, you know, predictability is a really important part of how we learn. And so when that's not there, that is stressful, even yeah. with other stimuli as well. Um, so they used um, a third model of stress uh, induction, which is called nociceptive stress. So that's um, pain induced stress. Um, and they do this by injecting um, an analog of capsaicin, so the chemical in, for example, tear gas, but also in hot peppers that um, is un unpleasant. Would you call it a chemical irritant? I would call it a chemical irritant, yes. Yeah, although, would you call that a chemical? <laughs> <laughs> although anything is, a, I mean, chemistry is the building block of life. So I, I think everything is a chemical in some way. Yeah, not only is it a chemical, it's organic even. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I so um, I worked with C57s before and I did not realize that they like went gray like this. I've never seen this before. Hmm. So I've seen I've actually seen this um following 6 hydroxy dopamine lesion of the dopamine system. You'll see pa patches of gray hair, but um it was I don't know, it was I never systematically thought about it. Um oh. but what they see is that with a, with an injection of this capsaicin analog that there are large parts of the fur coat that become gray. Um, and this happens throughout the whole body. So not just locally in the area where this, um, this toxin is injected. How long does um, it take I'll, to, I'll how, long this it, RTX. how long does it take to get gray after the injection? So that's a, I'll address that in a second. That's a good, okay. uh, kind of segue. So, so hair growth. So I didn't know very much about hair growth. Um, I'm not very good at it either, but I didn't know very much be about it right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so hair growth happens in a set of three phases. So the first phase is hair growth called anagen. The second is hair degeneration called catagen. And then the third phase is kind of this regeneration phase called telogen. And um, hair pigmentation um, arises during anagen um, when melanocyte stem cells, which are present within the hair follicle, um, differentiate um, or proliferate, and then their progenitors differentiate or their descendants differentiate into um, melanocytes, which then migrate towards the bottom of the hair follicle and produce melanin, which gives um, black hair its color. Um, and there are another set of stem cells called hair follicle stem cells that are from an epithelial um, origin that then produce the hair itself. And these different stages happen with different frequencies in both people and mice. So in mice, there are um, rounds of antigen, which um, are developmentally like stereotyped. And the first one happens um, like within the first three weeks of life, and then they become progressively more spaced out as the animal matures. So in this paper, when the, the antigen that they look or the, the hair growth cycle that they look at takes just a couple of days. So they inject the the uh pepper basically right and they a couple of days later they start to turn gray no so okay so if they inject so what they do is they inject the paper during antigen and then what they see is that after that round of catagen and telogen the subsequent antigen 
hairs then are gray oh, okay. so it's not that so the once the melanin is produced the hair remains black mm. but the but the stem cells then do not proliferate for the next round of hair growth Got it. okay and if you and if you um, inject the top the pepper and in telogen you also don't have new hair growth in antigen mm. the with or new black hair growth in antigen ah so is that why so you know some people like when they have chemo and that sort of thing they they're when you know they lose their hair but then when their hair comes back it's often gray and i'm wondering that, that must be something similar right like it's um killing off the stem cells and that's why you're you're gray afterwards exactly yeah yeah that's i never i didn't make the connection but i wonder if that's stress mediated or just from cell division inhibitors yeah right? probably both <laughs> <laughs> yeah um so the so this gives them a very nice model to now try to understand what part of um, the hair coloration kind of system is disrupted after this nociceptive stress. And um, the first thing that they look at is um, whether these um, melanocyte stem cells go into the kind of the base of the hair follicle. Um, or whether it's a deficit in melanin production. And what they see is that the melanocyte stem cells fail to, um, get, fail to uh, proliferate in the following um, RTX stress. And so that suggests that there's a deficit in kind of melanocyte stem cell function um, after injection of RTX. And you can imagine that this happens for a number of different reasons. So one thing could be an autoimmune attack so, for example, in alopecia, there's autoimmune attack of the of uh, components of the hair follicle that prevents hair growth. Um, and they do a series of experiments to rule that out. So they use mice where RAG1 is deleted. Um, so there's no B or T lymphocytes um, or they deplete um, B or T lymphocytes with CD11 that are expressing CD11B and they see that the graying still occurs. Um, and then so stress can induce um, different types of hormones in the body. So kind of the classic um, uh, hormone that we think about are glucocorticoids. So um, when you're stressed, your adrenal gland, which um, sits near the kidney, um, produces glucocorticoids, which circulate and are act as a hormone to signal stress to the rest of the body. And then there's a, a neural pathway called the sympathetic nervous system, which uh, secretes norepinephrine locally that in that signals kind of the um the stress response mm -hmm. and um we uh, you know in textbooks learn about the sympathetic nervous system as uh, signaling fight or flight um and so this um or rest or digest or, or like first rest and digest um so the sympathetic nervous system innervates many organs the heart so it changes um heart rate and kind of contractility of the heart or gut motility so um, to uh, increase or decrease um, bowel movements. So they decided to say, well, okay, so this stress induces hair graying. Which of these two possible pathways, either glucocorticoids or the sympathetic nervous system, are signaling to make the hair gray? And through a series of experiments that are interesting, but maybe for the sake of time we won't go into, they rule out glucocorticoids. Um, and Instead, they which I would say is kind of surprising. I mean, I don't. This is not. I don't know a lot of this, but you know, I always think about the glucocorticoids, whatever. <laughs> I don't even pronounce it <laughs> uh, as being the 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 stresses that are hanging out for a long time. Whereas noradrenaline, you get that spike. You know, that sort of classic flight or spike response, and then it's gone. Then it's gone. Um, anyway, we'll carry on. <laughs> No, no, that's, I agree. But, and I mean, the other thing is that presumably the sympathetic response is more localized, um, which is surprising. If, if you look in figure one, the pic, I mean, this gray hair is quite generalized, suggesting that it might be this hormone that's in the blood system. Yeah. Um, but I don't think you can interpret their data in, in a way to suggest that glucocorticoids play a response. Um, they eliminate glucocorticoid receptor from the molecular Anocyte stem cells and or they remove the adrenal glands, so glucocorticoid production, and neither of them eliminate hair graying. I think it's it's quite interesting that I mean the, the the both of these papers have amazing 
technology driving the experiments, right? Which it seems like it took, would have taken years to do all of this. They make various mice, uh, genetically modified mice. And I think in this one, one of the things they do is they can deplete um, the receptor for either one, uh, corticosteroids, for example, using a, an inducible deletion uh, approach in modified mice, right? It's just incredibly sophisticated. Yes, both. I mean, both the each figure in both of these papers are is so dense, yeah. <laughs> um, but the experiments are so elegant. There's a lot yeah. of very classic, necessary and sufficient ex or experiments to show necessity or sufficiency, which are really, really nice. Yeah, yeah and this is, I mean, modern papers like these, we're not modern, but the last 20 years or whatever, they've just become more and more, to get a nature paper, this is what you have to do. It's like each figure is probably a couple of years worth of, you know, work. <laughs> yeah. A couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> Some of these are many people's many years. Yeah. Right. And that's why you have 25 authors on each of these papers, you know. Or many times multiple co-first authors. I saw the few the other day with, you know, five or more. <laughs> five? Oh, my God. <laughs> Yeah, my favorite is the five first authors, five co-last authors. That's a... Oh, my God. Yeah. I saw some, yeah. like, co-middle authors the other day, and I was like, oh, I didn't even know that that was an option. They're like, these fifth and sixth authors contributed equally. And I'm, I was like, oh, <laughs> neat. Yeah, actually, my first my first research paper ever, I was co-second author. <laughs> <laughs> That's and I was amazing. An, I, I was an undergrad, so I was like, oh, I don't care. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll take whatever. Um, okay, so as Vincent alluded to, they use these very exciting technologies to to um, to kind of get at how the sympathetic nervous system affects melanocyte stem cell function. Um, so um, first, uh, an interesting technique that they used um, – is fact sorting followed by RNA seq. So they can express a fluorescent protein in this population of melanocyte stem cells, um, and then they can dissect out um, the skin. They can make a single cell suspension, um, purify only the fluorescent cells, and then sequence the transcriptome of these cells. And what they find is that these cells express beta two adrenergic receptors. Um, so the sympathetic nervous system signals with norepinephrine. Um, which could then be sensed by a beta-2 adrenergic receptor. Um, beta-2 receptors are G-protein-coupled receptors um, and are coupled to cyclic AMP and, um, and calcium activity via L-type channels. So what they wanted to know was whether this nociceptive pain, so injection of pepper into, in, into you, um, leads to activation of um, beta-2 adrenergic receptors. And they use a molecular... Um, proxy for activation of um, beta-2 receptors, um, and they, they look for phosphorylated CREB. So CREB is a transcription factor, and it's phosphorylated when cellular cyclic AMP levels are increased. And giving the nociceptive toxin leads to an increase in phospho-CREB um, in melanocyte stem cells. Elimination of the beta-2 adrenergic receptor gene uh, cell type specifically and temporally specifically. So they're eliminating this gene only from these cells at a certain time, um, blocks the effect of the, t of the pepper on graying. So we're actually going back to that, um, the, the single cell RNA sequencing, you know, the, the, this is a relative new technique. Um, and sort of to Vincent's point, I mean, traditionally, to figure out what a cell actually expresses, you know, in terms of whatever protein in your family you're looking for, usually would take a long time. And yeah, in one, almost in one experiment, you can look at the whole transcriptome, which is every gene that's expressed in the single cell, and, um, and figure out, you know, which ones look uh, interesting in terms of signaling. I mean, I'm... I'm I think just from an outside perspective, that, that, it still amazes me how we, we can do these kinds of things um, and, and get to the answer fairly quickly. Well, now with all these tools, you don't even have to fax sort anymore. If you have some sort of activity tagging, there's all kinds of ways to isolate neurons that are only activated by this or that and then figure out what they are. And it's crazy how fast technology is moving in those kind of spaces. Yeah. Yeah, there was... Uh, so. 
I guess two weeks or three weeks ago now, there was a virtual dopamine conference um, where, so there were, I think over a thousand participants um, on zoom and there were several talks where they use this kind of activity dependent tagging. And it's just, there's so many potentials with these new, with these new techniques. Um, okay. So I think that, so, so at this point we, what well, we can sum up that they've suggested so far is that, um, the beta two adrenergic receptor in these stem cells is important for, um, is critical for the graying that's induced by this pain, pain stress. Um, and, but one one other way to address this kind of pathway is to ask whether sympathetic signaling, either by local norepinephrine release or by activation of the sympathetic nerves themselves, um, would be sufficient to drive hair graying in the absence of stress. So what they do is they inject norepinephrine um, and they actually see localized graying at the site of injection. Mm. Um, and in, in my mind, this is one of the strongest pieces of evidence suggesting that nor epinephrine signaling is critical for graying. Yeah, that's a cool experiment. Yeah, it's really it's cool. old technology um, too. You just inject something into the mouth, <laughs> right? This is this is the great thing though, is I think that the best papers have a nice mix of the new technology yeah, with yeah. some of the old techniques. I mean, we figured some of this stuff out. Like, I think a great thing that people overlook is like six hydroxy dopamine lesions. Those things still work great for a lot of the questions we have. And I think people sometimes look for like new fancy technology. And I think for certain questions, like Jason just brought up, the new fancy technology is like light years ahead of where we were. But then for other questions, sometimes the old school pharmacology approaches are the best way to answer the question. And they're even better than the the new fancy stuff and more selective. So I like the, the mix of this paper of kind of mm. old school, new school ways of doing things. Yeah. Yeah, it's really nice. And then especially when you can combine the old school ways of doing things with new techniques so mm -hmm. that they can use kind of the conditional knockout technology only in these stem cells and show that norepinephrine injection then has no effect. So it's really, it's like a very elegant antagonist in some ways. Um, so the, the next question was, could endogenous norepinephrine induce graying? So when they inject a large amount of norepinephrine exogenously, they, of course, can, that's sufficient to induce graying. But what if um, that is kind of a, not a physiological stimulus for graying, but instead, um, and uh, instead local uh, stimulation of sympathetic nerves would not produce a high enough level of norepinephrine to induce the graying. So to do this, they went about it in two ways, again, using kind of this necessity versus sufficiency um, experimental approach. Um, so if they lesioned the sympathetic nerve innervation of the skin, um, they can block the uh, effect of stress on graying. So seeing that local norepinephrine release from the sympathetic nerve is required for graying. And then they can also use a system that a new technology, a newer-ish technology that we brought up last time on the last episode called DREADS, um, which are um, G-protein coupled receptors that have been um, engineered to not respond to their cognate ligand, but instead respond to an exogenous compound um, called CNO or clozapine N-oxide. Um, and what they've done here is they've expressed a dread that uh, leads to GQ signaling in the presence of CNO um, in the sympathetic nerves and show that just giving CNO mice that are expressing the dread um, can lead to graying in the absence of stress. So, um, so this, yes, this is a new technique or relatively new technique that I think is also super cool. I think it's on par with after genetics. So, but I mean, I just want to explain, you know, I think we should explain how it works because so basically it's a receptor that doesn't activate, does not activate by any endogenous ligand. So nothing in the, the body is going to activate it. And so you add this exogenous drug that doesn't um, exist in the body. Mm. So it's very precise, right? So only the drug should activate um, the, the receptor and then they've made the receptor coupled to the signaling pathway that should then activate the cell, the nerve, the, the, the nervous, the, the, ner the neuron. Um, 
So it's it's kind of like that optogenetics where you get this really genetic precision in how you activate the cell, um, but but it also allows you to activate many cells if you wanted to because you can just systemically you know put in the drug. Um, right, but I think one of the things that's really important about dreads that's different than optogenetics is optogenetics. You're using these channels, right? So you're making the cell fire. So that's like right. great, right? You induce action potentials. The cell fires. It does something. With dreads, what you're doing is you're using a signaling cascade from a receptor that is you've applied, but it's something that, was, that the cell uses. So you can ask questions that are a little more complex, right? How does this signaling cascade change the way the cell functions? And so it's more of a fine-tuned kind of thing where you're acting on a cell's like actual normal function and saying, what happens if we turn this up or down mm-hmm. rather than, you know, opening a channel and saying the cell fires. So I don't know. I think that they're actually really both cool techniques, but I think people oftentimes overlook the kind of nuance of like what dreads give you. That's a little bit more, I don't know, complex and maybe I don't want to call it like biologically relevant, but you can ask questions about signaling cascades that you're inducing in a cell rather than just firing itself, which is, I think, really cool here because you're you're kind of acting on mechanisms that are obviously within the cell. They're there within the cell rather than in kind of making the cell do something they, they, yourself. Right. Yeah, no, that's, that's actually a good point. Although I'll say, um, you know, oftentimes those signaling cascades in specific cells have not been worked out very well. And so then you are hijacking what what is normally happening in the cell, but oftentimes we don't actually know how that works. <laughs> oh, I think that's totally true. And I think one thing people forget is that dreads are working on things in the cell. So if you express a receptor that has no internal machinery in that cell, right. like, and then people just assume it's going to work, but it's a little more complex than that, right? Like if you say, oh, I'm going to activate a, GQ receptor in a terminal that doesn't express any other type of GQ receptor, then my question is always like, how are those dreads actually working if there's nothing in there to couple to? Right, right. And so it's, it is a, com- I think it is like, you're right. It's a little bit more of a complex mechanism than people like to think uh, sometimes, but it's really, I mean, it's a huge advance and I think made a lot easier than optogenetics for people to employ and behaviors and right. things like this. And I'll, okay. So I'll rain on the parade a little bit. Um, so the, <laughs> Sorry. So, um, so dread, the dread system has kind of, there are kind of give and takes in the community about the specificity and the both temporally, uh, yeah, I guess I should put like temporally temporal specificity. Um, so of course, GPCRs exist in equilibrium between activated and inactivated and in the presence of the agonist, it biases towards the activated state. Um, but simple expression of these kind of designer receptors do sometimes lead to low level activation of the downstream signaling cascades in the absence of CNO. Um, and you'll see in these experiments, mm. a lot of times four groups. So you have virus, so you have dread and no dread. And then in each of those CNO and no CNO. Um, the other side to that is that CNO itself is a modified version of clozapine. And there were a series of papers that show that it's metabolized to clozapine, which is of course a psychoactive drug. Mm. Um, so there are some, um, efforts to make perhaps more specific ligands for these receptors. Um, but again, it's always in the context kind of of the, in the controls. Have you shown that this works in your cell type, which they actually do quite nicely in figure three. Um, and just kind of thinking critically about the experiment as opposed right. to, as Aaron said, just saying, Oh, these have to work because they work. well. And, and this is actually something that I think optogenetics has always been touted as like the amazing thing, but this has these issues too. The channels you express are leaky. Some of them cause all kinds of fun stuff at terminals that don't happen at cell bodies. So you have an opsin that inhibits the cell body, but at terminals, it causes a proton pump leak and causes increases in release probability and all kinds of fun stuff like that. So I think what, what comes with any tool, and this is, again, as a behavioral pharmacologist, this is like what you've always been taught, is that there's always limitations. And so the question is, how do you control for those? What conclusions can you make? And how can you apply multiple techniques, which the thing that this paper does really well is they don't just use one tool, right? They do this 10 different ways and they say, do here, here, and here. So maybe the dreads are great for this and they use the right controls, but they're not perfect, but they kind of signal in on this and 10 different approaches. And I think that's where the really, the power comes with all these new technologies is that you can use 
many of them to kind of get to the kind of ground truth, knowing that each has their limitation. But if they all are pointing to the same answer, that's probably better evidence than just a one-off experiment. And so I think that's actually part of what makes this paper so powerful. Yeah, exactly. Totally agree. Yeah. This, yeah. I mean, there's lots of lessons here for uh, budding scientists. Get You have the right <laughs> controls and use multiple mm-hmm. methods to get at your question. Um, for the non-scientists, you know, the, I would say the cool thing about all of this is that we're able to manipulate cells at ever better precision. <laughs> <laughs> so if I understand, so what they've done here, they've made this artificial receptor and they have an artificial drug that binds it. It's only in, and they can have it only in sympathetic nerves and mm-hmm. show that if you activate the nerves, which is this this artificial compound CNO does, that leads to white hair, right? Correct. And you do, they don't actually look for noradrenaline here, but because of everything else that we've found, it must be working that way, right? I mean, would you have liked to seen uh, somehow remove noradrenaline from this particular dread experiment? Would that have helped? Or record noradrenaline and show that it's actually being released. Yeah, I think yeah. that's one of the things with the, the, these receptors is the yeah. question is, you're definitely activating the receptor where you think you're activating it, but is it actually causing the release right. of noradrenaline in this case? As an analytical chemist who likes to record oxidizable species like that, that would be like the Mm. thing I would ask for. But uh, the other experiments suggest that that probably is what's happening. Yeah, right. Got it. And I mean, also remember these are these are probably quite low levels of nor like norepinephrine in the in this. It's well, I was about to say in the synapse, but it might not be a (laughs) synapse. It might just be kind of spilling over into this area and. so yeah, but you could imagine ha- having a uh, tyrosine hydroxylase knockout or that's conditionally expressed that would block norepinephrine synthesis just in these nerves. Mm. Um, okay, so the final the final piece of this paper um, is um, kind of is addressing the question of why is why does stress um, and sympathetic nerve activation and norepinephrine signaling lead to hair grain and one idea that you can imagine is that the norepinephrine leads to cell death in the melanocyte stem cell population. Um, another could be that they function in inappropriately. So they um, either don't produce melanocytes or the melanocytes that they produce don't produce melanin. Um, and the third, which is what they show, is actually very, very interesting in my mind. Um, and what they show is that um, norepinephrine drives a kind of a loss of the stem cell population by leading to a hyperproliferation. So these stem cells, which are normally quiescent or not dividing um, in the absence of proper cues, for example, during antigen, hyperproliferate, they differentiate into melanocytes, and then they migrate out of the hair follicle base. Hmm. So these cells that are no, no longer able to produce melanin in the correct place, and the stem cells are then the stem cell population itself is then decreased, reducing future melanocyte production in subsequent antigen cycles. So it's, it's a, actually a very interesting mechanism that you could imagine kind of druggable targets blocking proliferation or migration of the stem cells after norepinephrine um, exposure. You mean making a drug that prevents hair graying? I think there would be quite a market for that. There probably would be. That's so funny. It's not like something that kills you, right? <laughs> well. Yeah, but it's van- vanity sells more more products than anything. Yeah, it's I true. totally understand that. But it's, um, yeah, well, <laughs> you, you could just dye your hair, right? <laughs> yeah, the- <laughs> yeah, but this, well, I was about to say this would be all natural, but it probably would have. Yeah. So uh, th- does this imply that the stem cell number is limited? They're not renewable? So the they are renewable as so this is I this is a little bit outside my my ballgame. But from what I understand, they are renewable, but they're only renewable during specific cycles and within their like their niche. And this proliferation and migration drives them out of the niche and prevents further cycles of, of renewal, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, this was all out of my niche, so you, you can say <laughs> anything. <laughs> um, but maybe we'll maybe we'll get some listener feedback and we'll find out. <laughs> 
Um, okay, so we can transition to the second paper. If, oh, before you uh, do that, unless, let me ask yeah. you. So this is stress-induced graying. There's also age-induced graying. Do you think there's similar mechanisms involved? Do we know? I mean, I guess getting old is stressful, too. <laughs> Maybe that's part yeah. of it. Yeah. Well, maybe it's probably to do with the. I'm sure the age isn't it just that the the stem cells themselves stop dividing or something like that. But why? I guess. Well. And also, you could imagine that the rate of graying is different for different people. So it's not just age itself that's a factor, but it's kind of age times something else. Yeah. Probably yeah, either stress or genes. Sure. Or, yeah. But, yeah, because you know some people that get gray in their 30s versus. Sure. Sure. Uh, or as I like to say to my lab, pre-tenure versus post-tenure. <laughs> <laughs> and mice don't get gray with age, do they, as far as I know? I mean, they don't live very long, a couple of years at the most, but I've never seen a gray mouse. So you couldn't use that as a model. That's what I'm saying, I suppose. Yeah, and, I, don't, hmm. I wish we had Andres here because he was knows people who study kind of hair patterning and color patterning, stripe yeah. patterning, I guess, in mice. So, hmm. But maybe he can fill us in next time. Okay. Um, okay, so the second uh, paper will be more of a twin twig crossover, I would say. A lot of viruses um, in this paper, man. It's great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, okay, so the paper is called Brain Control of Humoral Immune Responses Amenable to Behavioral Modulation. Um, and the first author is Zhu Zhang, and the last author is Hai Chi. Um, it was published in Nature just a couple months ago, and it's from a number of universities in China. So, Xinhua, um, Shanghai Tech, Capital Medical, Wuhan Institute of Physics and Mathematics, and Nantong University. I guess this was all um, done before the pandemic, right? <laughs> it must have been. <laughs> I was thinking about that. Well, uh, you, I wonder if it, actually, when you look at the, I was just looking at the, the front page here. Um, the first submission was December 2018. Whoa. Oh, my God. So, I was just about to bring that up. Like, <laughs> yeah. And only accepted in 20th of March 2020. <laughs> so you guys asked for a lot of more experiments, huh? Yeah, it's it's a problem. It's a real problem. It's typical of nature science cell that they make you do unending more experiments, right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. At least it was accepted in the end. Imagine March 2020 getting the reject. Um, yeah, <laughs> I've seen all of the. I've seen all of the above. Yes, yeah, for sure. Oh, in the end, we don't really like this. You know, great. <laughs> yeah, nice job. But we just like we're not that excited about it. Yeah. So sorry. <laughs> you think those people will get gray after that? Oh yeah. man. <laughs> uh, anyway, sorry, yeah, where we go. <laughs> No, no, no. It's, I had a I had a paper that was um, where I did six months of revision experiments, which really isn't that much. Send it back, and the reviewer said that it wasn't aesthetically like for up to the journal standards, and was rejected. So aesthetically, it's, what aesthetically, is, what does that I mean, even mean? Like the figures know, weren't good enough. I mean, I was like, I mean, look, I'm not an artist, but I mean, it, doesn't, it doesn't look so bad. It just, I mean, also, if it's just the figures that don't aren't pretty. You can make them pretty. I mean, this is bizarre. I, I got a, we just got a review the other day that was a negative review that said that it, that our use of color was unnecessary and that all of the <laughs> figures could be grayscale. I've and I was too. just like, I mean, yeah, they could, but I've, we I've, have the internet now, so we don't have to pay for it. So we, we've had that one and they called it gratuitous use of color. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, but you know, there are some experiments. I don't know if people publish western blots right where it could be nice looking and it might not be and you could imagine them saying wow this is too schmeary i don't want to see this here but still if it says the if it gives you the answer what's the difference right well that's true yeah if it's hard to interpret yeah then yes but then the review should just say that yeah it's hard to interpret your data not like i just don't like the, the look of your data yeah my, my- i think it was I was no, gonna I say my, my partner's uh, philosophy is that if we all just accepted and like uh, committed to making really awful figures with like very little graphic design, that science would be better because then one, everyone would have to actually use their data, but two, it would take less time in like graphic yeah. design for scientists who are not graphic designers or some of us aren't. My husband <laughs> definitely is not a yeah. graphic designer. Yeah. <laughs> I am definitely not. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I'm right. pretty picky about figures, but I, and I think it's, it's always funny in science because, you know, students, especially when you tell them, well, you just worked on this figure for five minutes, but it took you 
a year to collect the data. So why don't you spend more time <laughs> you know, on the final product because that's the output of all that work. And so why don't you make it as good looking as possible? Yeah. I wish someone had said that to me when I started. I think I have a typo in like every paper I've ever had like in the figures <laughs> and like some like weird subheading that's like really small and I have to live with that now. I go back to those papers that I'm just like, that is, embarrassed. That's, actually, yeah, that's, that's true too. Once it's out there, it's out there forever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I miss on my first paper. I misspelled a co-author's name, which was the worst. That's bad. So, and, oh, no. and it was a first name, Jeffrey, which is even w- more embarrassing. <laughs> uh, so. I, I, I was like really big on the names because I was like, I'm gonna not mess these up. That's the stuff that people get real mad about. The other stuff, I'm like, as long as the data is very good. Now, now I'm a little. Now that I run a lab, I'm a little bit more on top of uh, everyone else. I like use like a microscope to go through and looking for things. Uh. Yeah, it's good to have multiple checks. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. So, right. speaking of these papers, where I haven't found any typos yet, there are. Wow. <laughs> um, so, yeah, no, these are very nice. So, so what? I'll give you a brief kind of background of what we know about how the brain interacts with the immune system, and then we'll go into this paper, which I think kind of um, opens a totally different paradigm uh, within this field. Um, and a lot of so a lot of this work has been done by a lab. Um, in actually on Long Island um, at, at Northwell uh, LIJ, um, led by Kevin Tracy. And what they've been working on for about 30 years is um, what how the brain controls inflammation. And they've come up with this idea called the inflammatory reflex, where um, the immune system um, can signal to the brain via cytokines and the immune system can sense brain signals via neurotransmitters and it's a feedback loop. Um, that means it's a homeostatic pathway essentially. So that, um, when the immune system ramps up, um, central, the central nervous system can then signal to the immune system to calm back down. And of course, in the context of COVID, um, we know that, uh, that hyper immune responses are detrimental. Um, so you can imagine that this being uh, fairly important in kind of disease or severe infectious disease. Um, but almost all of this work has focused on innate immunity. So for the neuroscientists out there, there, there are two arms of the immune system. Um, there's innate immunity. Uh, so these are um, responses to any type of pathogen or um, invader that um your cells are kind of standing guard at all times to defend against. And then there's adaptive immunity, which um, is led by B and T cells, um, which after seeing the pathogen, then develop a response so that a subsequent infection can be cleared faster. Um, And in particular, B cells produce antibodies, which are circulating proteins that um, can bind to a virus or other invading um, pathogen and, and clear it from the body. Um, and then T cells are involved kind of in more cellular mediated immunity. So, um, they can interact with, um, proteins on our own cells, which express, um, which express, uh, so small pieces of foreign peptides and signal that there is either an infection going on or that there's some sort of, um, different set of proteins that are being expressed in our tissues and then can either induce an antibody response via B cells or can actually kill the cell that's expressing this strange peptide. Um, Vincent, you can tell me if I'm, if I'm missing something big here. (laughs) So far, so good. Okay. (laughs) Um, Okay. So in this paper, they focus on the adaptive arm of the immune system. And what I mentioned before was this inflammatory reflex tamps down the innate immune system. And the takeaway from this paper is that um, this the central nervous system can actually activate or enhance the adaptive immune response to a pathogen. And a lot of the adaptive immune response happens in an organ called the spleen, um, which is found in your, in your belly, in the left upper part of your belly underneath the rib cage. Um, and a lot of blood flows through the spleen um, and cells are constantly sampling what's in the blood um, and then presenting different types of pathogens there. Um, and then you have these adaptive immune responses. Um, so for example, B cells will be selected 
that have reactivity against an invader. They can then make antibodies. Um, and this happens both in T cell dependent and T cell independent manners. Um, the splenic or the spleen is innervated by the sympathetic nervous system, which we spoke about earlier, um, via a, a nerve called the splenic nerve. And the splenic nerve comes out of the spinal cord um, and then innervates, um, innervates throughout the spleen. Um, they have beautiful histological or like immunofluorescent um, images showing these sympathetic fibers actually going through the kind of the nice cytoarchitecture of the spleen. Um, and really inter like interacting with both B and T cells. Um, and what they asked was if they eliminated the splenic nerve, um, in this case, by doing a surgery where they inject alcohol, which kills the splenic nerve, um, could they affect immune responses? Um, and they measure two different types of immune responses. So, they measure the germinal center response, which I'll explain in a second, and plasma and the plasma cell response. Um, so the germinal center is a kind of this um, tissue structure where T cells and B cells and other immune cells are interacting. It's a kind of this highly stereotyped architecture, um, which allows for sampling of extracellular fluid and then presentation to B or T cells. Um, proliferation of activated B or T cells, and then kind of maturation of those cells into different subsets, which um, we won't go into except to say that one subset is called a plasma cell. And these cells are a type of B cell that produce a large amount of antibody. So plasma cells are, in, you can imagine them as antibody factories. Um, and what you see is that so these, so these germinal zones... I don't know. So one can think of it as the the fire the firehouse for the fire engine, and then you're sending out the fire engines from these germinal zones. I mean, so is that where they get all the equipment for fighting infections, basically? And they're trained there in some ways, they're right? Like you could, yeah. So you could, or and or at least selected for duty, I guess. Is they're also the, they're also found uh, they're also found in lymph nodes, right? Uh -huh. As well, you have germinal B and T centers, and so any lymphoid organ, I think, besides the spleen, right, Ori? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And lymph nodes and the um, lymph nodes and the spleen have very di can have different types of training programs for these cells. Mm -hmm. So um, you can imagine a lymph node in the lung may be more useful to fight the flu yeah. versus um, lymph nodes in the spleen dealing with bloodborne pathogens or something. I else. see. Huh. And then, and then the new thing here is that. Did we, was there, is this the first observation that the nervous, this, there's actually nerves in here or did they know that already? No, no, that has been known for many, many years. Okay. Um, but what they showed was that in mice, which where the um, splenic nerve has been removed or has been killed off, um, the response to an immunogen injected into the gut or into the peritoneum um, leads to uh, reduced plasma cell production. Hmm. So you need sympathetic nervous system signaling to have proper plasma cell production and presumably an antibody response. Is that the only function of this nerve, you think, to to deal with um, antibody responses or does it do something? I mean, there's no pain sensors in there, right? So what else, what else could it be doing? Um, so you could imagine that it can affect vasculature. So the, so um, arterioles or venules within the spleen usually are sensitive to sympathetic nervous system. So that would constrict the okay. blood vessels. Um, and I'm sure there are other things that I frankly don't know, but right. um, they think about this actually very nicely by showing that the gross anatomy of the organ is not different in the absence of the splenic nerve. Yeah. So one explanation for the reduced plasma cell production is that the the germinal center is completely disoriented or the spleen necrosis in some way. And that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. And they also have this really nice internal control of the germinal cell um, B cell production, which is normal in this case. So it's really plasma cell specific as opposed to kind of a global B cell response. Okay. So the nervous system is in a, almost in a, a real time way, constantly, uh, signaling to this area. Is that what, is that what the idea is? 
Yes. And then, okay, so, yeah. I mean, maybe we'll discuss this. Maybe we should discuss at the end of the paper, but why? <laughs> why would you want the nervous system at all involved in this? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm thinking, Uri, if you think hard enough, can you make antibodies against SARS-CoV-2? Well, <laughs> so well, a, so there's, there's a lot of data out there now with, well, I mean, one, you think of like microbiome stuff, but two, with just like immune responses and cytokine responses and their ability to regulate cellular function. So a lot of these things are, these immune responses are kind of all tied together. So there's tons of data if you inject cytokines or modulate, use dreads to modulate specific circuits in the brain, you could cause cytokine release locally and peripherally and that those can regulate not just um, like immune type or like sickness behaviors, but also things like motivated behaviors. So, I mean, it would make sense that these kind of systems would play a really big role in just basic learning. I mean, think about how you could adaptively update information in an environment. If you got sick or a specific environment was associated with some like immune response, you'd want some bi-directional communication between circuits that encode information about, you know, whether you want to do what you did before or or how to make decisions given the kind of state. But in this case, the the brain is um, monitoring what it seems like something that's responsible for you know, mounting an antibody response. Um, but wouldn't you want that in autopilot? I mean, I understand the cytokine stuff is, I think, almost a, a byproduct of the fact that there's um, the signaling ca- capacity of those things are, you know, um, they're used in different ways in, in the brain versus the immune system. So you get spillover. Um, and in some cases, you say you, you'd want to learn or maybe have your body learn something about the infection. But in this case, it's, you're basically derailing the immune system if you get rid of the nerve. Uh, it just doesn't make sense to me. I don't know. So, yeah, I mean, I guess so, I, I guess thinking of it in ice. I think a lot of these papers we think about these in isolation, right? Because that's how the paper's written. This goes here, and that's it. But there's probably a more complex level to this too, right? It's not just mm-hmm. like oh, then that goes offline and everything's screwed. So, so I think that one one way that I have been thinking about this is that. So, so you don't want an immune response to everything. And if you are stressed, that is signaling some sort of danger. So for example, like, let's say you mm. were to see a snake and you then are bit by it and there's a toxin in your blood, the stress may make that immune response more strong against the toxin to prevent future, mm. you know, to, to be prophylactic against future snake bites. Um, whereas if you're not stressed by the snake bite itself, maybe the body says, okay, it's not dangerous. So there's some sort of like cognitive control over the response. Um, and, but in this paper in specifically, if you look at the end of the discussion, they're in some ways actually arguing that you could have psychological training to enhance your immune response. <laughs> Uh, um, and we'll, we'll get we'll get at why they suggest that in a little bit um, shortly. <laughs> so they have a second um, control here, or they have a second kind of conceptual point, which is that there are different types of immune responses. And I actually didn't know this, but there can be B cell responses that are T cell independent. Yep. Um, and in they try to they check whether the B cell responses that are T cell independent are are affected by splenic nerve denervation and they don't see an effect. So that suggests that you need T cells to mediate the effect of the sympathetic nervous system. Um, And what they do is they propose a model, which, so this is gets at another aspect kind of of scientific paper writing, which is, I think that I actually think that they could have had this paper written completely opposite where they have the final figure as the first figure um, <laughs> because they make a couple logical jumps to get to the next point um, that I, that I was a little bit confused about and then made sense in the end. Um, so what is known is that B cells express um, norepinephrine receptors. I'm sorry. B cells express acetylcholine receptors but less so norepinephrine receptors. And T cells express an enzyme called choline acetyltransferase that synthesizes acetylcholine. And we've known from the literature that T cells themselves sense norepinephrine. So what they suggest is a model where the the splenic nerve releases norepinephrine, 
that stimulates T cells to synthesize acetylcholine and then B cells sense the acetylcholine. Hmm. This is a little bit weird because usually you think of the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system as opposites. And we know the parasympathetic nervous system releases acetylcholine. So it's actually a sympathetic nervous system hijacking a parasympathetic signaling pathway, um, which I found fascinating. Hmm. Um, and so then they, um, create of just at, at their whim, create three different, uh, CRISPR induced knockout mice at their whim. Of, <laughs> at their whim yes. At, um, <laughs> of different acetylcholine receptors. Um, and so there are three acetylcholine receptors that are expressed by B cells, um, and what they find is that the beta-1 and beta-4 acetylcholine receptor knockout mice have strange phenotypes. So, for example, um, the uh, beta-1 knockouts, so these are total body knockouts. The beta-1 knockouts are uh, embryonic lethal, presumably, because they never got a knockout. Mm -hmm. um, the beta-4 knockouts um, had few litters, and so there were fewer pups. So they then chose to study the third knockout of the alpha-9 um, acetylcholine receptor, which uh, presumably was the easiest way to study this phenotype. Um, it's, it's difficult to study a knockout mouse if you can't generate the knockout mice. <laughs> um, and what they found was that they, in splenic plasma cells, the alpha-9, with, with, alpha with the alpha-9 nicotinic receptor knocked out, um, they had reduced acetylcholine binding capacity, suggesting that expression of this receptor is important for binding on B cells. Um, and then they use an experimental paradigm that is very common in immunology, but for a neuroscientist, I, I hadn't really thought about it very much. And what they do is they can take a mouse um, and lethally irradiate it so, and eliminate all dividing hematopoietic cells. And then they can transplant cells from a different mouse, usually a transgenic mouse, into the irradiated mouse and do an experiment where they test whether a gene is required only in the cells that are transplanted. Right. So in this case, does that make sense? Yep. Perfect. Yeah. No, is the, I always love those kind of experiments. These sort of, you know, transplant experiments, basically. And they're very, they're so elegant that I had, the funny thing is I had a friend who was trying to do these adoptive transfer experiments, except his mice weren't fully backcrossed under the C57 background. And there was MHC, like there was HLA haplotype mismatch. Mm -hmm. So his adoptive transfers weren't taking and it took them a while to figure out. Mm -hmm. So they're quite technically challenging, I should say. Um, and the CRISPR knockouts were made on the black six background. So they have everything kind of together to do this experiment. Right. Yeah. Um, and what they find is that when they adoptively transfer these alpha nine acetylcholine receptor knockout B cells, you uh, you have a reduced plasma cell production. So it phenocopies the splenic nerve denervation. And then they do this additive experiment where they denervate the mice after the adoptive transfer, and they show that the effects don't add up, suggesting that these are in a linear pathway. And this is a complicated but really elegant experiment. Um, and to further kind of get at their model, they then deplete the intermediary between the sympathetic nerve and the B cell, which is the col choline acetyltransferase, choline acetyltransferase mm -hmm. expressing T cells um, with diphtheria toxin. And mm. this is a really cool, um, another really cool technology where you express a diphtheria toxin receptor um, only in um, chat or choline acetyltransferase expressing cells. And then you can uh, inject the diphtheria toxin, which kills the cells that are overexpressing this receptor mm. that you've specifically expressed in these cells. Um, so that depletes all of the chat expressing T cells, and that is sufficient to reduce the plasma cell response. So they've yeah. really nicely shown this linear pathway here. Yeah, and that diphtheria toxin approach has been used fairly often in, in neuroscience. It seems to be pretty clean that you can you know, just kill the cells that express the, the receptor and you get little, the way that the cells die doesn't spill over so that you get all this other mm. nasty stuff. Yes. 
um, yeah, this is like a, is a fairly widely used um, tool. Though the downside is that you don't have temporal specificity. So you these mice then have no chat expressing T cells for until they're replaced in some right. way. Um, okay, so this leads to the third big question from the paper, um, which I think gets at what we were talking about earlier of why you would want nervous system control of the immune response. So they're asking what, what controls the splenic nerve? Um, and they repeat some experiments, which have some anat an anatomical tracing experiments, which have been done in other, um, in other model organisms. So for example, in rats, and they inject a pseudo rabies virus, which then retrogradely travels up the splenic nerve and then will cross synapses um, into kind of the higher order brain structures within the forebrain or the mid or the brainstem that then is are synapsing onto the splenic nerve cell bodies in the brainstem or in the spinal cord. Yeah, I have to say that these, my, my colleague Lynn Enquist at Princeton pioneered the development of this virus. It's a herpes virus, pseudo rabies virus as a trait as a neural tracer. It travels up and down nerves, and you can put fluorescent proteins uh, genes in it and see where it goes. It's just amazing. <laughs> it, it, it's actually really – it is amazing. But the thing, the thing that I am fascinated by is why – so we don't know how it actually crosses the synapse and that why it's specific just for one synapse. Um you know, well, no some one... of them aren't specific for one synapse. Some of them keep jumping synapses. Right. So it just depends on what mutation, if you have the, the yeah. certain ones yeah. that are deleted or not. Because the original ones, would you would just time how long, like 24 hours was one synapse, 48 hours was two or something like that. And then they came out with the ones that only jump one. Right. But we still don't know how it crosses you know, from one side to the other. Yeah. No, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And there... And there's a lot of questions about whether that's actually synaptic or not, right, Jason? Like, or are two cells that are in proximity, will they be labeled w yeah. without a direct synapse? And there's also, well, I think it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's fairly synaptic, but there's there's other modulators. So, like, act the, how active the neuron seems to also influence how efficient this happens. And so, there's something there with, you know, some sort of receptor on one side, and uh, the rabies virus is hijacking something on the presynaptic side. Um, but what that is, is not clear. Yeah. I, um, so so I'm, I'm trying to go back and see. So I think that this is one of the rabies viruses, which is not monosynaptic. Mm. And they, they inject it and wait quite a while. So they wait 96 hours. So this should be labeling brain regions, which are probably multiple synapses mm -hmm. from the splenic nerve. Um, and what they label are very interesting brain nuclei. So the first thing that they label is the hypothalamus. So um, this is kind of a, a brain region that we spoke about in the last episode of TWIN that's important for many homeostatic functions. So feeding, drinking, sex, aggression. Um, they label the central amygdala, um, which is uh, important brain nucleus for fear processing. Um, and then, and sorry, in particular within the hypothalamus, they label the paraventricular nucleus. And so one hypothesis that they make is that stress or fear induction could lead to activation of the central amygdala or the paraventricular nucleus, which I'll call the PVN, um, which would then activate the splenic nerve and lead to changes in the immune response. So they use now a kind of a whirlwind of the greatest neuroscience techniques to address this. So the first they use optogenetics. So we briefly mentioned this um, before. So this is an ion channel, which is activated by light. Um, and they express this in subpopulations of neurons within the paraventricular nucleus or the central amygdala. Um, and they can show that when they record activity of the splenic nerve, they see an increase in the firing rate. Um, of the splenic nerve when they activate these central brain nuclei. And then they um, use, uh, so then they, so they move from, so this suggests that there's a synaptic pathway connecting um, these two, um, these two uh, brain regions or these two brain regions and the sympathetic nerve. So then they want to get at whether these brain regions are important for the immune response and they first use uh, an ablation approach. So this is similar to the diphtheria toxin ablation, 
but they use um, caspase expression, which is, so caspase is a cellular enzyme that leads to apoptosis when it's activated. Um, so this should eliminate neurons where it's expressed within the amygdala and the PVN. And what they see then is that this uh, ablation phenocopies um, the splenic nerve denervation. So just eliminating certain populations of neurons in the amygdala and the PVN is sufficient to um, reduce the immune response. Mm. Um, they then use dreads. So this is, uh, instead of using an excitatory GQ dread that they did earlier in the paper, they first use an inhibitory GI dread where the GPCR is coupled to a G um, alpha subunit that's inhibitory. And they inject that in the PVN and in the amygdala. And they show that just reducing the activity of these cells, not even having the neurons die, is sufficient to reduce the immune response. And these, finally, these are the, mice that are just running around their home cage. They're not being subjected to any other correct weird experience. So, but this again suggests that there's some sort of tonic you know, activation of this pathway, uh, which still doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> yeah. So, although you could imagine that, I mean, for anyone who's worked with mice, I think we know that it's that they are generally kind of probably baseline stress. So there might be some stress associated mm. with the procedure itself. I, I mean, that's a kind of a hand wavy explanation, but um, yeah, I agree with you. And um, finally, they show they use the GQ uh, expressing um, they use the GQ dread to activate these neurons and they show that this enhances the immune response. So this is a bi-directional modulation of the immune response with, from brain regions within the central nervous system. So, um, I don't, I don't, I'm not used to looking at these kind of facts, uh, data. Is this, are these changes like significant in terms of bio, like, are they actually, I mean, I'm not talking about statistically significant, but, Biologically, functionally, what is the implications? <laughs> That's a Vincent question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's hard to tell. It's like you're getting, you know, like 10 to 20% changes, which is significant, but I don't really know what that means in terms of function. Well, and also remember that this is a global, these are not even antigen specific plasma cells, right? So you can imagine that some of this proliferation could be non-specific plasma, like plasma cells against other antigens. Um, I I don't know the answer. I think it's a good question, though. It's not clear. I guess yeah, you could. I guess that's the follow-up is that you you mount some sort of immune response. You like you look to see if this actually affects some sort of um, infective. You know, yes, infective exactly. Disease. I think that's the key. If it's functionally relevant, right? In the in the face of an infection of some kind, yeah. So I think they could do some similar. They could use a mouse virus, right, and and look at some of these alterations and see if it really makes a difference or not. Maybe right. it doesn't. <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. So that's that's definitely a limitation of this paper. The immunogen is is a protein as opposed to some sort of infectious virus where you could test yeah. kind of the, the memory response or the plasma cell response and protection. Um. Okay, so we can skip ahead to the next figure. And um, so th this is kind of where I got to the point where we were, um, where we had mentioned that, they, that they're suggesting you could kind of train your immune system to have a better response. And they developed this very mild stress paradigm where they put a mouse on an elevated platform just for a couple of minutes a day. Um, and this is in contrast to some of the stress paradigms we mentioned in the beginning of the episode, um, such as restraint stress, where they're restrained for several hours every day. Um, so you could imagine that this is mimicking kind of just a low level stress that might not be too intolerable for a patient who needs to enhance their immune response. Um, and I'm saying this like mildly facetiously, but um, and so what they see is that this um, kind of mild stress uh, paradigm leads to increased activity in the paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus and, this, and the amygdala. Um, and they do this by measuring calcium transients um, with GCAMP. So this is a, a genetically engineered fluorescent protein whose fluorescence increases in the presence of calcium. 
and increased cellular calcium is a proxy for neuronal activity. Um, and then they show that this elevated platform standing for just three minutes a day for a couple of days is sufficient to increase plasma cell, the number of plasma cells within the spleen. Um, and this elevated platform standing, the, the, the effect of it on the immune response is dependent on the sympathetic nerve. So if you take a mouse and you denervate their splenic nerve mm. and then you put them on the platform, it has no effect. Um, and these are, I'm, I imagine, mm. quite complicated experiments. And if you look at the dots, there are probably like almost 30 mice in some of these experiments. So it's pretty crazy. Um, and so the last point that I think is interesting about um, this this uh, paper is that they then compare this to a, a stress paradigm that is more that is more intense. So they use a ninety minute restraint paradigm, which is of course more than three minutes of being on a platform where they can freely move. And in that case, they actually don't see an effect on plasma cell production. Hmm. So this suggests that kind of the magnitude of the stress is important for modulating this effect. You know, in, in humans, stress is generally associated with decreased responses, more susceptibility to infectious diseases, right? So I can see where this pathway could modulate that, although it, it may be the severe stress is what people are are experiencing right and that would make sense so now th the context of the whole control makes more sense to me i think because um we see a mirror in in humans yeah it was assumed that was you know chronic stress that takes um you know days or yeah, whatever i think so yeah. versus something like this where it sort of it does seem like it's monitoring real-time experience uh, in a way. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, I mean, it's very interesting. And I think that, but I think I initially saw this paper, read, read the title and thought, oh, this is going to be talking about why severe stress dampens the immune response. I mean, it's actually the opposite, right. which is, right. which is, it's just interesting and kind of tells you not to go based on the title, but <laughs> it's, it's a very nice paper. Yeah. I'm very impressed yeah. with uh, all the technology. But, yeah, the um, cross fields, right? Their their behavior, you know, all kinds of other things together, which is circuit tracing. I mean, this is like systems neuroscience, but then yeah. also good immunology work, and so it's kind of cool yeah. integration. Yeah, exactly. No, I, but this is where I think the the I don't know the most fake breakthroughs happen is these cross uh, disciplines. Mm -hmm. I, I would yeah, like I them to do the infection experiments, right? So cut the cut the splenic nerve or whatever, ablate it, and infect the mice. Are they any worse off than you know unablated mice? I mean that's exactly. a pretty straightforward experiment, and um, it would be maybe there's no difference. I don't know, yeah. <laughs> which would be too yeah. bad if there's no difference, right? <laughs> After they do all this work, maybe they, yeah, maybe they did it and they didn't see a yeah, it could be. <laughs> maybe they're still working. I think it's very interesting. It, yeah, yeah. I mean it. It doesn't make it doesn't make sense that it wouldn't have some sort of function, you know, to have that sort of feedback and specificity and, and the connectivity. It's doing something for sure. Or in people who don't have spleens, what happen? Do they have more susceptibility to infection? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah. So, for example, like people who are have no spleens, they're immunocompromised relatively, and it's to specific types of pathogens. Mm -hmm. um, so, usually, like encapsulated bacteria. Um, so you'll see that they get like pneumovax and other mm -hmm. kind of vaccines more than people who have their spleens to try to give them a little boost from non-spleen non-spleen immune system. Got it. Got it. Neat. Cool. Yeah. All right. Um, okay. Thanks, Zori. That was great. Good job. Yeah. Thank you. Very nice. Um, yeah. So. Awesome job with two two really complicated papers that you yeah. explained very very well. Yeah. Good. I think it shows your medical medical training right there. I think neuroscientists, you know, so narrowly focused and <laughs> wouldn't have a clue about how the 
how the immune system works. Although he didn't no, know, no. he didn't know about T cell independent antigens. He probably learned that in medical school, but he forgot, right, Ori? Yeah, that's just too many years ago. <laughs> <laughs> You're still a, oh, that's right. You 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 took a break and got a PhD. I forgot about that. <laughs> oh. Yeah, exactly. So I so that was probably six okay. seven years ago. But um, no, but the, one interesting thing about being in the clinic is that you realize that all of these kind of psychiatric, not animal models of psychiatric disease are these like pure models where nothing else is going on in the mouse. And then you go into clinic and the person with depression has heart failure and doesn't have a spleen. And so how does, how do all of these things interact is very, very, very interesting. Right. Yeah, that's true. That's very true. Uh, we like to, the scientists like to take all the variables out and then yeah. you go into the clinic and you can't do that. So yeah, we do reductionist stuff, right? But you can't always. Um, let me read two brief emails. Uh, first one, Sue Ellen. Hey, all longtime Twix member have listened to Twin since it started. Just caught the latest episode. Imagine my surprise when I didn't hear Vincent's dulcet tones. But Ori did a great job taking center stage. Unfortunately, the sound quality of Nero Shah's portion was really poor. I started out listening in the car, but moved to earbuds in the house so I could hear better. Yet another consequence of the current pandemic, everyone is on cell phones and the quality of the sound suffers. But great info, as always, even if a lot was over my head. Keep up the great work, twin team. Sue Allen is from Roswell, Georgia. Yeah, sorry about that. You know, the pandemic has pushed us out of our normal recording uh, routines, and we're still trying. To, I'm still trying to get it right. Same. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, yeah it goes we, for all of us. I think we did go a little too uh, high level last time. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, she's uh, not. Well, she didn't complain too much about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the hard thing, right? For scientists, we're so used to being in the weeds, and then then yeah, kind of, of talking about stuff on these kind of. I mean, I think this group is good, right? Because we all have different backgrounds. So even though we're all scientists, there's. Stuff that you guys say that I'm like, oh, that's neat. I'm learn you learn something new, so I think it keeps us all in check, which is kind of yeah. a good thing. So yeah. over on, and then if you talk about immunology and you really know nothing, it's easy to talk high level. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, oh, that can be a problem on Twiv, where we're all virologists and we start getting in the weeds, and people say, "You start, I don't know what you're talking about." And yeah, it happens. Um, we try not to do it, but just it happens spontaneously. So. And it's good to hear from listeners so we can kind of calibrate. For, as sure, well. for sure. Yeah, I guess that's the other thing is I'm still not exactly sure who's who's tuning in each time. So, uh, Todd writes, thank you so, so much for all the podcasts on Microbe TV, the virology lectures you put on YouTube. I'm a semi-retired psychiatrist now doing telehealth two half days weekly and thoroughly enjoying your programming. I would like to suggest a possible topic for a future podcast. And uh, t- Todd... Uh, sends a link to a paper. Is it possible that COVID-19 is directly affecting hypothalamic control of the autonomic, autonomic nervous system's management of the immune response? Mm. Wow. So relevant to today's it certainly is. conversation. Yeah. Um, but maybe at the beginning of the next episode, we can kind of just have a brief update on COVID and the nervous system yeah, and sure. psychiatric and neurological kind of cool. consequences. So, yeah. Cause I, I saw this uh, article recently showing that or not showing, but talking about a lot of these COVID patients uh, when they come off the ventilator. So when they're on the ventilator, they have to be you know put in a coma. Um, when they come out of it, they're not, in it, they're not coming conscious. There's, some of them are taking weeks to gain consciousness, almost like, uh, recovering from a stroke. And so, yeah, there's definitely something going on there. Yeah. Well, Jason, in answer to your question, so we have at least one psychiatrist listening, uh, Todd, and then <laughs> right. Sue Ellen uh, is not a scientist. So, you know, we always yeah. have a mix. We, we attract a mix of people. Yeah, it's great. It's very cool. All right, that's twin number seven. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash twin. Questions and comments, please send them to us, twin at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, consider supporting us, microbe.tv slash contribute. Ori Lieberman is Ori Lieberman on Twitter. Thanks, Ori. Thanks, Vincent. This was fun. Aaron Calipari is at the Aaron Calipari. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah, thank you. And thanks, Ori, for, for organizing this one and doing a great job at going through this. 
Thanks. Jason Shepard is at Jason Synaptic. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, thanks, and uh, I agree. Great job, Ori. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Neuroscience. Neuroscience.